Is there a simple explanation for every object and artifact discovered by a scientist or archaeologist during the course of their work? No, of course there isn't. We don't mind that, though, because when the experts are puzzled by the things they find, it leaves us with a mystery to solve. Do we know enough about the mysterious discoveries in this video to explain them? Eh, let's give it a try. Some artifact discoveries seem so out of place that it's tempting to write them off instantly as either a hoax or a practical joke. Here's one of them. In 2008, a tiny Swiss ring watch was found inside a Ming Dynasty tomb in Shanxi, China. The tomb definitely hadn't been opened for at least four centuries prior to 2008, so there's no way the watch should have been there. There's no doubt that the artifact is what it appears to be. It's made of metal, it has the word Switzerland etched into its back, and its hands are stopped at six minutes past ten. Switzerland wasn't founded until 1848, so it isn't possible for the word to have been etched into the back of a watch before the tomb was last sealed in the 17th century. Explanations for this bizarre discovery are thin on the ground. One idea is that Tomb Raiders broke into the tomb at some point prior to 2008 and accidentally left the watch behind. If that's the case, they did an expert job of resealing the tomb on their way out and don't appear to have taken anything valuable with them. An even more outlandish idea is that a rodent burrowed into the tomb and somehow took the tiny watch with it. Does either explanation seem likely to you? When you're dealing with an ancient Egyptian mummy, sometimes there's more to it than just the mummy itself. As a case in point, here's the material that was once wrapped around the Zagreb mummy, which was acquired by a Croatian businessman in 1848 and donated to the State Museum of Croatia in 1877. It wasn't until much later that someone noticed there was something a little unusual about the mummy's wrappings. That wrapping is now known as the Liber Lenteus. It's one of the most impressive and important records of the ancient Etruscan written language in the world. It's just a shame that we can't understand what it says. Even now, historians and language experts haven't been able to crack the Etruscan language, so our knowledge is limited. In the past few years, though, we've made enough breakthroughs to arrive at the idea that the subject matter of the Liber Lenteus is a calendar of some sort. Most likely, it's a calendar of ritual events. There are even a few academics who suspect it might be the fabled Etrusca Disciplina, an Etruscan cultural text that was held in high regard by the writers of the ancient Roman world. But we've got a lot more translation work to do before we can confirm or deny that. Our next artifact has several names, but precisely zero credible explanations of its origin or purpose. It's the Disk of Sabu, also sometimes known as the Schist Disk or the Saqqara Disk. The latter name is a clue that it was discovered in Saqqara, Egypt. The best guess of archaeologists is that the 5,000-year-old artifact is a highly elaborate candlestick holder. If that's the case, it's the only one of its kind we've ever found. The fact that it's obsidian suggests there's more to it than a simple candlestick holder. Obsidian is a notoriously difficult material to work with, and nobody would go to the trouble of making a candlestick holder out of it back then when other materials were available. Even the fact that it's shaped like a wheel is a puzzle, because, as far as we're aware, the Egyptians were yet to discover the wheel 5,000 years ago. Conspiracy theorists on the internet will try to tell you that this is the steering wheel of an alien spaceship. We're not about to believe that, but the candlestick explanation is wholly unsatisfying. Our next mysterious discovery isn't technically an artifact. Or, at least, we don't think it is. It's a phenomenon known as a septarian nodule. You can find examples of them all over the world, but they're especially prevalent in the Gulf of Mexico and southern Utah, USA. Septarian nodules usually come as spheres, which appear to have been elaborately decorated. They look a little like mud balls, some of which are full of yellow crystals. While there are some fringe theorists who insist that septarian nodules are of artificial origin, scientists are convinced they're a specific type of sedimentary rock concretion. 
They argue that most of the examples in the Gulf of Mexico were formed between 50 and 70 million years ago, when decomposing sea life, sea shells for example, attracted the sediment around itself and created basic mud balls. As the tide went out, the balls dried and began to crack. When the tide returned, it deposited more sediment into the cracks. Eventually, aragonite formed on the edges of the cracks and yellow calcite formed within the empty spaces, thus completing the distinctive shapes and patterns. Next up, we have a Kigango. What is a Kigango, you might ask? Well, it's a wooden memorial statue of the kind carved by the Mijikenda people who live on the southeastern coast of Kenya. They don't look especially humanoid in shape, but they're supposed to be effigies of the human form. Nobody knows when the practice of erecting Kigango effigies began, but in the old days, they were built to last. Once they were erected, they tended to be left there until they rotted away, a process that could take centuries. Each Kigango was roughly life-sized and would be painted in colors that were relevant to the deceased. Andy Warhol was known to be a great admirer of Kigango and kept several of them in his galleries. There are several more in the museums and art galleries of the United States of America, although public opinion is beginning to put pressure on the owners of those museums to return the artifacts to Kenya. In their native country, Kigango effigies are associated with a secret society known as the Gohu, about which very little is known. Some ancient artifacts seem determined to keep their secrets no matter how hard we try to find them. One of them is the Shigir Idol. Every time a new kind of test is performed on this wooden statue, it concludes that it's even older than the last set of tests suggested. The idol was found submerged in a peat bog in Russia's Ural Mountains in 1890. The archaeologists of the time estimated it to be 10,000 years old. That estimate lasted until 2018, when modern-day scientists carbon dated it with the assumption that they'd find out it was younger. To their astonishment, their tests gave the artifact an age of 11,800 years. The experts were so stunned that they sent the idol to another set of scientists for further tests. This time, the age came back as 12,100. That makes it more than twice as old as the famous Standing Stones of Stonehenge in England. The seven-foot-tall statue is decorated with indecipherable hieroglyphs and carvings of human faces, seemingly performed using beaver's teeth. Nobody knows who made it, or what its true significance might be. If we can't even determine its age, how can we hope to find out anything else about it? When the influence of the ancient Roman Empire began to decline in Europe, several other cultures and civilizations tried to expand and assert dominance. One of them was the Goths. They were only around for the blink of an eye in historical terms, but that doesn't make them insignificant. The Goths were the first Germanic people to accept Christianity, a fact that led to the creation of the Codex Argenteus. The silver artifact is still with us today and is considered the most magnificent of all the religious manuscripts of the medieval era. The Codex is the first translation of the Bible into the native language of the Goths, a task thought to have been ordered by King Theodoric the Great. The process necessitated the invention of a whole new Gothic alphabet. The king wouldn't allow the previous runic alphabet to be used because he thought it was connected to paganism and therefore unworthy. The Codex went missing after the king's reign came to an end and eventually turned up at Verdun Abbey in the 16th century, more than 1,000 years later. Nobody knows where it was for all those years. A Gebek el Arak knife, sometimes also known as the Jebel el Arak knife, is one of the most outstanding artifacts from the Nakata II period of Egyptian prehistory. This ivory and flint knife is somewhere between 5,200 and 5,500 years old and gives us an insight into cultural conditions in the Egypt of the time because it displays signs of Mesopotamian influence. The provenance of the knife is unknown prior to its purchase in Cairo by the French Egyptologist Georges Aaron Benedite in 1914. Upon returning to France, he immediately donated the piece to the Louvre, which is where it's been ever since. The person who sold George the knife 
said that it was discovered at the site of Gebel el Arak, hence its name. But modern day experts think the weapon is more likely to have come from Abydos. The most interesting aspects of the artifacts are the reliefs carved into its handle, which include the Master of Animals motif. It's a very common inclusion in Mesopotamian art, but had never previously been noted on Egyptian artifacts prior to the discovery of the knife. It's possible that the central figure in the reliefs is the god known as El, but it will likely never be possible to confirm that. The history of the artifacts known as the Jordan Lead Codices is controversial. The lead books were allegedly discovered deep in a cave in Jordan in March 2011. The metal pages contain entries related to the Kabbalah school of Jewish mysticism. After a year of investigation, numerous experts, including those employed by the BBC in the UK, dismissed them as fakes. Four years later, an investigation by the UK's University of Sussex was able to prove that the lead used in the books is ancient, but couldn't determine the age of the inscriptions upon them. Since then, nobody's been able to agree on whether the codices are real or fake. The pages are 2,000 years old, and so are the fragments of leather that bind them together. But historians have said that the inscriptions are full of errors and inconsistent, which suggests that someone found an ancient book and attempted to make it more interesting by trying to pass it off as religiously significant. Those who believe in the veracity of the codices say that what's written on the pages is written in code, and this is why they don't appear to make sense. We don't expect this debate to end anytime soon. Let's go to Mexico, where we find Zin Sun San. Aside from having a charming name that translates into English as Home of the Hummingbirds, this was once the capital of the Tarascan state on the shores of Lake Pátzcuaro. From here, the Purépecha grew and challenged the Aztecs before succumbing to the same Spanish invaders who routed their neighbors. When they disappeared, they left behind no written records. But they did live behind these five structures known as Yakata. They're a little like rounded pyramids, albeit lacking the pointed tops of such a shape. Each of the Yakatas once featured a wooden temple at its top, but they all either burned or fell down centuries ago. Archaeologists think that the temples were probably also administration centers, from which the matters of the families living in the 40 wards beneath the Yakatas were adjudicated and planned. Sadly, the good times didn't last for very long. Zin Sun Zan was founded around the year 1450, but was abandoned somewhere around 1530 after Spanish conquistador Nuno de Guzman captured and killed King Tanguachuan II. When this rare Long Sax fighting blade was found in Poland's Rudecki Landscape Park in August 2021, archaeologists were sure it was ancient. What they were less sure of was whether or not the blade has Viking origins, and the debate over that question is still going on. Although historians refer to blades like these as swords, it would probably be more accurate to refer to them as long knives. Although the people who found it are archaeologists, they weren't looking for it when they made the discovery. Instead, they were trying to pinpoint the location of a battlefield from the Polish-Pomeranian War of 1091. The blade is not thought to be connected to that battle. Instead, it appears to be a relic of the 8th century. The discovery is made all the more curious by the lack of anything else of archaeological significance in the surrounding area. The blade appears to be all on its own, which suggests it may have been dropped by accident. That would presumably have been a regrettable loss for its owner who used it in battle. The small bend on the tip of the blade is a telltale sign that the weapon had seen action. Other than that though, it's remarkably undamaged. Let's finish in the UK with a stunning Roman era discovery. This wooden figurine was found during an archaeological dig ahead of the construction of the new high-speed HS2 rail network which will run through the site of the discovery at Three Bridge Mill in Toyford, Buckinghamshire. Radiocarbon dating indicates that it was made somewhere between the years 43 and 70 in the first century. 
Wooden artifacts like this would have rotted away centuries ago under normal circumstances. But in this case, the figurine was protected from that because it was buried under layers of anaerobic clay. Even so, it hasn't quite survived the passage of time without incurring damage. The arms of the figurine are gone, as are the feet, but much of the impressive detailing is still visible including lines on the tunic and what might even be individual hairs on the calves. Experts are divided on whether the figure has a bouffant hairstyle or whether it's wearing a hat. They're also unsure whether it was buried as a votive offering, which is a gift given to the gods in the hope that they'll bring good fortune, or whether it was intended to be placed in a grave. Subscribe to the channel, turn on the notification bell, and enjoy watching new videos on my channel. Thanks for watching and see you soon!